a bed tomorrow. We gotta work for it today. We must learn to take our denial and truth it all away. We can grow from our struggles and the mistakes of yesterday. From the fields and the farmland to the dark and alleyway. way. celebration of the thousands in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio and the millions from coast to coast and around the world who turned out for marches, rallies, and protests in support of the resistance and to improve the plight of their fellow human beings and the planet which nurtures us all. With the tremendous success and inspiration of the Women's March, Interest and participation in subsequent actions have been overwhelming. We here at LBTV hope that viewers were able to watch our recent special coverage of that march. And if not, you can check it out and subscribe to the Liberation Brew channel on YouTube. Cleveland has been at the center of attention, starting with the protest at the Republican National Convention last July, where 16 were arrested and are still awaiting trial. And with the continuing investigation into the excessive use of force by the Cleveland Police Department in the African American community. As resident Trump has pitted the American working class against migrant workers and refugees, and as many of us struggle to pay our taxes and would like to see the president's returns, our first segments join in on the tax march rally April 15th. We then turn our attention to science as Cleveland, a center for medicine and technology, turned out doctors and engineers, factory workers and farmers, students and families in the thousands for the March for Science downtown. We also pay attention to the climate march that followed a week later. We then remember the demonstrations and arrests at the RNC last July and hear from young spoken word artists on police violence that has affected so many in our city. We conclude the show with our annual coverage of the opening day demonstrations. Change the name, change the logo of the Cleveland Indians, Chief Wahoo. Winds of resistance were blowing mightily on tax day, April 15th, as many gathered at Willard Park next to the Free Stamp in downtown Cleveland for tax march. Speakers including Friends of Liberation Brew, Genevieve Mitchell and Greg Coleridge. Issues were voiced about the inequities and inequalities of our tax system. How corporations are taxed at a lower rate than people. And that the President of the United States will not release his tax returns and Congress is proposing a tax bill that will further cut taxes for the rich.
thousands marched all across the country. And in Washington, D.C., there was a special guest speaker. Satire is the heart of political discourse, so it is a joke, and I'm the biggest joke on the block. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Now, first up, what's the big deal about my taxes? Okay, since you guys are my supporters, I'm going to share with you what's on my taxes, because this is between us, okay? Don't let the protesters know what I'm going to tell you. So what? I owe $50 million to Deutsche Bank? Who cares? Who cares? That's publicly known. But what you don't know is I know where all the Nazi gold is hidden in Switzerland. And I have it. And I have it. I have it. I have it. I have it. Just because I have dirty ties to Azerbaijan, I have so many ties to Azerbaijan. I have ties to Russia. And Russia tells me this all the time. They say I'm a great asset. A great asset. And then I became a great asset in the late 80s when I extended my finances to own illegal poker rooms in New York City, when I started selling properties way over the budget margin for cash so that I could hide Russian money in the United States. And now I got all the way to the presidency as the Russians are keeping me on a short lease because I'm a dog. But what you don't know in my tax returns is I have the original, uncut David Hasselhoff video of him eating a burger off the floor. Remember that? So if we want to release the tax returns, if we want to release the tax returns, we can do it. Boys, let's get the taxes. Where are they? What's the big deal about releasing my tax returns? First off, I claim Ivanka as three dependents. My daughter, my mother, and my wife. 
We're going to have the first White House divorce. I guarantee you. First White House divorce. Aren't you glad I'm not in Mar-a-Lago today? So we have these taxes, and we're going to release them. And I want you to know that everyone can look at them now, and we're all even, right? Am I now a good president? No. Even if I release my tax returns? No. That's right. Because no matter what I do, remember this, I am a prop. I am a brand less than a human being. And the truth is, excuse me, I'm a brand, not a tool. I'm a brand, I'm a brand. Let me do my own material, please. Let me do my own material. And I'm not the real guy, save it for the real guy. <laughs> save it for the real guy, okay? But remember this, just, I'm the United Airlines of presidents. And remember that the other airlines are just as bad. So if you remove me, we have 40 years of people corruptly manipulating the system back here, over there, and all around this country to screw you out of your own interests. Very important. And I like screwing, but not that way. So you need to make sure it's so important that you don't just focus on me, but on the system that put me in place. Let's remember that. Let's look at you're cheering for me. Isn't this weird? It must make everyone so uncomfortable. What do we do? So let's release them, boys. Release the taxes. There we go. There we go. Releasing the taxes. I told Jared to shred my taxes, but I thought shred was Yiddish for collate. We're going to make America. Great again, folks, when I leave office, hopefully next week. Thank you so much. I am home. I give you comfort. I shelter your family. See me for who I am. Home sweet home. I am your refuge. I am the floor that supports you, the foundation that keeps you steady, the walls that give you shelter, the roof that protects you. I am your home. If you don't take care of me, I cannot take care of you. Now a word from my friend here about science. How did America rise up from a backwoods country to be one of the greatest nations the world has ever known? We pioneered industries. All of this required the greatest innovations in science and technology in the world. And so science is a fundamental part of the country that we are. But in this, the 21st century, when it comes time to make decisions about science, it seems to me people have lost the ability to judge what is true and what is not. What is reliable, what is not reliable. What should you believe? What should you not believe? And when you have people who don't know much about science standing in denial of it and rising to power, that is a recipe for the complete dismantling of our informed democracy. Let us demand that educators around America teach evolution not as fact, but his theory. An increasing number of parents showing skepticism about vaccinations. Voters have approved a ban on GMOs. Call climate change unproven science. That's not the country I remember growing up in. Not that we didn't have challenges. I'm old enough to remember the 60s and the 70s. We've got a hot war and a cold war, a civil rights movement, and all of this was going on. 
but I don't remember any time where people were standing in denial of what science was. One of the great things about science is that it is an entire exercise in finding what is true. You have a hypothesis, you test it, I get a result. A rival of mine double checks it because they think I might be wrong. They perform an even better experiment than I did and they find out, hey, this experiment matches. Oh my gosh, we're onto something here. And out of this rises a new emergent truth. It does it better than anything else we have ever come up with as human beings. This is science. It's not something to toy with. It's not something to say, I choose not to believe e equals mc squared. You don't have that option. When you have an established scientific emergent truth, it is true whether or not you believe in it. And the sooner you understand that, the faster we can get on with the political conversations about how to solve the problems that face us. So once you understand that humans are warming the planet, you can then have a political conversation about that. You can say, well, should we, are there carbon credits? Do we do this? Do we put a tariff on, do we fund, do we subsidize? Those, those have political answers. And every minute one is in denial, you are delaying the political solution that should have been established years ago. As a voter, as a citizen, scientific issues will come before you and isn't it worth it to say, all right, let me at least become scientifically literate so that I can think about these issues and act intelligently upon them. Recognize what science is and allow it to be what it can and should be in the service of civilization. It's in our hands. One and a half centuries ago, civil war divided the United States of America, yet in its wake we would recover as one nation, indivisible. During the bloody year of his Gettysburg Address, President Lincoln chartered the National Academy of Sciences, comprised of 50 distinguished American researchers whose task was, as it is now, to advise Congress and the executive branch of all ways the frontier of science may contribute to the health wealth and security of its residents. President Kennedy addressed the Academy membership, noting, the range and depth of the scientific achievement in this room constitutes the seedbed of our nation's future. In this, the 21st century, innovations in science and technology are the primary engines of economic growth. Now, we must fulfill our Hey everybody, great to see so many people out there. I'm Sean Larson. Uh, I'm the owner of the Happy Dog and Happy Dog at the Euclid Tavern. <laughs> we are really happy because we get to partner with the Institute for the Science of Origins. Patricia and Glenn and Starkman uh, do this. It's a partnership between Case Western, the Natural History Museum, and Idea Stream. And they do great talks at both Happy Dogs. Hello everyone, how you doing? So I am honored to be the first speaker for today's March for Science Cleveland. I want to send a special thanks to all the organizers because this has been an exceptional experience. Working with these individuals is a prime example on how people from different backgrounds and experiences can unite and work together to have a successful event like ours today. <laughs> I 
I am Leslie Guayarite, a co-chair for the volunteer committee. My dad was in the Air Force and I grew up, my, spent my youth in, on Air Force bases, so I saw a lot of air shows. Look up. There I am. I am the sky. I am a warm and protective blanket wrapped around everyone on Earth. I can bring clouds, rain, and wind. I can be an ice storm. Without me, you'd fry. Every day, I am the breath you take in. Yet you are making me sick. I am congested, off balance, polluted. You see, I am more delicate than you think. It took millions of years to get it just right. My perfect mix of gases, temperature and weather that you enjoy. But now your cars, your factories and dust, they have pushed me past the limit. And you wonder why my typhoons and tornadoes are more intense, more frequent. I have become unpredictable. Less rain here, a lot more rain there. Hotter summers, colder winters. I cannot even control myself anymore. Enough about me. I will show my changing self to you in your days ahead. But in the end, I'll be fine. Give me a few thousand years. I have weathered trauma before. I am not worried for myself. Look up. available. We also put on workshops for middle and high school students to pique their interest in plant-based science and make them aware of the diverse number of careers available in the area of arboriculture and community forestry. Our strategic vision calls for us to help create vibrant green communities in diverse native forests in the Great Lakes region and we are committed to that change. An important effort we are undertaking right now is the Cleveland Tree Plan. As a core collaborator on the plan, along with Land Studio, Western Reserve Land Conservancy, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, and the City of Cleveland's Office for Sustainability, we are committed to increasing the tree canopy in Cleveland, Ohio. This is a big deal. Good morning, Cleveland! I am so happy to be here today. I mean, look at these beautiful faces. Oh my goodness. 
I was so excited when I walked in for the first time I saw was a little kid who might have been four years old with a sign saying, Science is real. Young protesters, old protesters, people who have never come out before to protest anything are standing up for science today. This March for Science is not about being liberal or being conservative. It's not about being a Democrat or being a Republican, being for the Green Party, being undecided. It is not about being an evolutionist or a creationist, but it is about a nation that has become the most technologically advanced nation because they supported, funded, and were listening to competent sciences in order to make policy. It is about the ability to understand and apply the most basic science elements to make a significant change in our fellow society. I have friends who are afraid to come out today. Scientists use jobs all over to be inside the laboratory working at discovery, creating things for humanity changing the way that we see the world, inventing new things, and yet these same people were afraid to come out because they were worried that it would affect their ability to do science. They were worried about coming outside and that it would all of a sudden politicize science. Well, let me tell you to my friend, to my scientist friends who are still working in the laboratories, doing fantastic work, that it's about time that we come out and stand up. It is our responsibility to be able to come and to teach science to the world. We made a mistake. We've done great work, but we have to share this. We have to make sure that our children get educated to be able to understand the scientific process. You ask the question, how is it that a young man who worked in a cotton field for two years in Alabama who was the son of a janitor slash minister, all of a sudden shows up and becomes a professor at Case Western Reserve University. Science is for everyone. And we must defend science with every moment of every energy of our body. It is about real facts, not alternative facts. We are not here because we want to. We are here because we have to. Because of that, this is why we march. This is why we march for change. This is why we march for intellect. And this is why we march for science.
A week after the highly successful March for Science, tens of thousands of people turned out across the United States and 100,000 marched in Washington, D.C. for the People's Climate March. As you can see, the situation is getting very tense here. 
Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. We're going to have more live, uncensored, unfiltered, independent media coverage coming here away on youtube.com forward slash we are changed. Subscribe, donate, invest in us because without you, we would not be out here. We are changed our forward slash donate if you care about getting the news live, unfiltered, and uncensored as you're seeing it right now. crimes don't do time they get fined a slap on the wrist till they do the same thing next time black blue brown collars do lifetimes making dollars for private prison profiteers those who wear the white collars those behind the drug wars those behind the real wars those behind the street violence those who enforce our silence because think about it who else has the money to fly drugs from Colombia to the hood I think it's funny if you think that it's the drug dealers, they ain't got shit. The true criminals are the ones who don't do time for it. Those who make our lives a living hell will never spend a day in jail. Murder and work is killing the earth all so they can sell for $12.99 a pair of jeans. In the pockets are starving children's screams. Blood and tears of sweatshop workers sewn into the seams all so that we can buy, buy, buy. That's the American dream. Those who are the true supervillains of the world will never spend a single moment in a prison cell. Those who underpay their workers, forcing them to fight for quarters, then turn a blind eye and wonder why people start doing drugs and start getting high, start robbing and murdering. Crime rates touch the sky as they fly their private jets, flying away from what they caused, laughing at the sorry laws that grant them impunity from destroying my community, while the so-called criminals don't enjoy the same immunity. Then the criminals get sent to prisons owned by the real bandits. The system is so messed up, I can't even stand it. But they'll never get caught because they run this nation. So next time you turn on a TV station and see black and brown people being criminalized, realize that that's the result of corporate crime in disguise. Corporate criminals are the crooks behind what we see as crime. But white collar crimes don't do time. They get fined. A slap on the wrist. So they do the same thing next time. I am the seed or the rhythm, the rebel, the rhyme, the mixed breed between time. My father was the Harlem Renaissance and hip hop was like my mom's from the Bronx. Man, I'm talking from doo-wop to beatbox, from Langston Hughes to Tupac. Next for the spot, young King Arthur's armed with deadly weapons over swords. Cause what's a revolution without the Renaissance? Same song, different verse that inspired the civil rights. Real life behind these Penn State bars. Sentence to life. Cause with bullets are right wrongs and cursive with your name on them. Can't ask questions before you bust a cap lock on them. Period point blank range. Smooth criminal, I'm gunning on them like they shooting her. Huh? All made you look. You a slave to a page in my rhyme book. Music so heartfelt, cardiac arrest flow. 5 0 call a crime scene. Murder ink dripping out my mouth. Pages wedged between my teeth like a starving artist. I'm about to feast. A political threat jumping up out of these sheets. Gil Scott, public enemies. Spike Lee, last of a dying breed. Count Dracula to the rap game. Sucking it dry and weeding out the weak. I'm at your neck, homie. Allergic to vice style. You lack hard, therefore, I capella the chant on repeat. The rhythm, the rebel, the rhyme. <laughs> the real, the revolt, the renaissance. Ah, the rhythm, the rebel, the rhyme. Mm, the real, the revolt, the renaissance. You look at me as if I am dirt. I am sure I am the ugliest thing you've ever seen, but should I take a different form? Should I be something less of myself because you feel uncomfortable? We have the same skin and come from the same hood, and yet you still stare at me ignorantly like I'm an alien. The word Oreo falls off your tongue like vomit. Sounds of nails across the chalkboard hits my eardrums, and before my quote-unquote overly smart mouth opens, <laughs> I step back, take a deep breath, and here I go. Why can't I be intelligent, confident, beautiful, creative, a ballet dancer, talented, outgoing, have manners, and treat myself like a queen without my fellow sisters and brothers assuming I'm trying to act white? 
In that case, what are our people thinking of themselves and where they come from? I refuse to be anything less than what I was rightfully born to be, with black power big in the Atlantis. I come from the seed of an activist, but you wouldn't know that, would you? I said, I come from the seed of an activist, but you wouldn't know that, would you? What you don't know is, I don't switch games, I switch styles. You gotta know the people that you're around, cause I can go from business to chillin', from friendly to villain, and all in one sentence. So, if you don't think that I act black, then redefine your definition of color, redirect your hatred, and realize that black can be confident, beautiful, and as a people, we can achieve anything. So it's springtime in Cleveland again. Time for blooming buds, lakefront picnics, buzzing lawnmowers, dreams of a pennant winning season, and Cleveland's own special pastime, racism. For over 20 years, our video collective has documented the demonstrations outside Fort Progressive to protest the demeaning Chief Wahoo emblem and the baseball team's nickname, Indians. Native Americans from all over the country come most years to help educate fans about how the nickname and the Wahoo served to stereotype American tribal peoples, how the use of the face paint and feather headdresses mock their religion, how the comments about the war path and scalping totally misrepresent Native American history and culture. While isolated tribes and occasional individuals have indicated that they don't mind, every major national Native American organization has made it clear that sports team names and emblems are racist and foster unhealthy and misleading stereotypes of their people. After scores of high schools and colleges and a few professional teams changed their nicknames, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, NCAA, declared about 10 years ago that they will not allow any team nicknames or mascots hostile and abusive to Indians at any NCAA postseason tournament. American students all over the country and their advisors are getting it. Why can't we? How long do you think a team named the Cleveland Jews with a caricatured, caricatured image for an emblems, uh, emblem or the Euclid Negroes with caricatured Uncle Ben or Aunt, Je Aunt Jemima would last? Somehow we can get that this is not okay when it comes to these two groups. If we just open our hearts and widen our understanding a little more, we can see that it's also not really innocent fun if our behavior causes young Indian girls and boys to have to grow up with distorted images and stereotypes of themselves and their families promoted all around them. I love Cleveland baseball and I've loved it all my life. How does changing the name of the team harm my memories? How does it harm the actual tradition of playing the game? Bob Filler still played for Cleveland. Rocky Calavito still played for Cleveland. Jim Tomey and Manny Ramirez still played for Cleveland. Changing the nickname of the team doesn't change the joy that fans have had watching these extraordinary players. It does, however, reduce the pain and discomfort for thousands of our brothers and sisters. I said in one, and in two, three strikes you're out at the old
Children of tomorrow, for the children of. 